Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I am Worship Associate Judy Amir. I am joined in worship leadership by Worship Associate Chris Flan. Our musician this morning is Forrest Howell and our cantor is Kay Rittinger. We also have technical support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis and greeter Jane O'Neill. BUC is a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Even in our virtual format, we are a thriving community with a place for everyone. All people of goodwill are welcome here. Social justice is an essential component of our lives. We are a capital W welcoming congregation and a green sanctuary congregation. Our social justice work this year is focused on civic engagement, racial inequality, economic inequality, and environmental justice. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then later posted on Facebook. After the service, we invite you to stay for virtual coffee hour. If you are worshiping with us for the first time, Today, we extend a special welcome to you, and we hope you'll stay after the service. We have a couple of announcements. Keith, uh, join Keith Ensroth this Tuesday, May the 4th at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live for our monthly Vespers. This is a joyful yet introspective evening service that centers gratitude for the day that has passed and welcomes the night that is beginning. The service will include the lighting of memorial candles, candles of concern, and candles of hope and joy. Information for candle lighting can be submitted via this link on our website under worship links or shared in comments on the Facebook Live video. To view the service live, visit the Birmingham Unitarian Church public Facebook page at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, May the 4th. The video will also remain on Facebook for later viewing. Next Sunday, May the 9th, the humanists of BUC have a very special opportunity for us. Professor Bruce Pollock Johnson will be joining the humanists for a presentation of the proposed eighth principle of which he is the co-author. The eighth principle also happens to be the topic of the reflections in our recently published May newsletter. So read up on it and join us next Sunday evening to hear about the eighth principle from its co-author. And finally, we invite you to stay after the service and before coffee hour, we'll have a brief presentation from the Leadership Development Committee about the voting tool that we'll be using uh, in this upcoming congregational election. And you will have a chance to stay in the main meeting and to ask questions. Thank you for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit and it is good to be together again. Yesterday was May 1st, May Day, celebrated both as the International Workers' Day and as an older celebration of the arrival of spring. This morning, we are looking at May Day in a different sense. The term we are exploring comes from the French, venez m'aider, or come help me. The mangled English version, May Day, when repeated three times, May Day, May Day, May Day, is an internationally recognized signal of distress. It says, my ship is going down and I need help. When in your life have you had to send out your May Day call? Did someone answer? How did they rescue you? When have you heard that distress call from someone, a family member, a friend, a complete stranger? Did you respond? Were you able to rescue them? Calling out for help can be a surprisingly difficult thing to do. Helplessness in response to the call can be overwhelming. Today, the day after May Day, we ponder May Day. 
now our service begins. Sometimes our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. And now our next hymn, hymn number 318, We Would Be One. Opening words this morning are from Elizabeth, Elizabeth Mount. From our very first breath, we reach out 
co-regulation, not self-regulation, is in our nature. We find our cues from the sun and the moon, from each, other, each parent and caregiver. We find our place in this great turning planet by turning to one another. Generation to generation, we awaken to the dawn and fall asleep at the evening's end. Our life's journey is part of something greater, something simple, something divine. A flame cannot be lit without a spark. A life cannot begin without the air. And we cannot begin to find ourselves without love. May we reach out to one another. May we offer love and nurturing care. May we join together in celebration of the interdependence of our lives. In this spirit, let us worship together. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to create a free and welcoming community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. The weekly offerings serve as an ongoing reminder of this mission. Sharing in this weekly practice of generosity also strengthens the bonds between congregants and our high purposes. So let there be an offering in support of this beloved community and our good works. Contributions can be made through our website, Venmo, username at BUCMI, or a check in the mail. However you choose to give, please do so with a heart of gratitude. This is the time in our service where we lift up our joys and concerns in the presence of our loving community. We will be turning off the recording to allow privacy for this sharing. Let us take a moment of silence to hold each other in our hearts. A prayer of sorts by Richard M. Fuchs. Many of us, oh God, don't believe in prayer. We're more comfortable with meditation, particularly the silent part. And some of us aren't sure we believe in God or we scarcely know what the word means. But we do know that we care, that we care about one another and the kind of world we live in. We care, dear God, we care, and sometimes the care we feel scares us because we're afraid to care too much, too much for those we love, too much for friends and companions along the way. If we could pray out of the deep well of our capacity to care, we might say, oh God, let this care we feel become mm -hmm. the bond of love that unites and heals us within and without, that joins us in body and spirit with the hopes and aspirations of people everywhere. Let our loving concern for those in our midst be the spark that inflames our loving concern for universal humanity. If we can't pray for lack of words or for too little belief in the power of prayer, then, dear God, let our care be our prayer. 
and may we find the answer to all our prayers spoken and unspoken in the daily human expression of our loving concern. Hear our prayer, O oh God, as we dare to care now and here and everywhere. Amen. Now I invite you to join Kay in singing hymn 391, Voice Still and Small. May Day is the international call signal for distress used by ships and aircraft that are in the midst of the most severe circumstances. Because of this, the word May Day sometimes denotes helplessness or desperation. People tend to cry May Day when they've reached their own personal threshold of despair. In her book, May Day, Asking for Help in Times of Need, Nora Claver asks, why do we wait until we reach that point of desperation? What stops us from reaching out and asking for help for even the small stuff? Asking for help is a universally dreaded endeavor. We often choose to continue on alone struggling valiantly and often unnecessarily with day-to-day -day struggles or even crises, convinced that asking for help would exact an emotional price too high. But in a world where people are living longer than ever before and may need ever more support over time, reliance on others has become increasingly necessary. It is time that the universal signal of May Day is sent. There just comes a time in everyone's lives where we can't move forward unless we rely on others. So why do so many of us rather go it alone when help is available just for the asking? As children, we were taught to share, but maybe not to ask for help. On May 2nd, exactly 10 years ago today, my husband of 46 years died. I had always relied on him to do many of the things that I didn't want to do or did not know how to do. Six weeks after that, I had my second knee replacement right when gardening season was beginning. We had many, many, many garden beds to weed, mulch, plant. And we'd always done that together without asking for any outside help. I didn't even think of gardening, didn't even have a chance to worry about it before my pushy friend, and she knows who she is, had recruited uh, a whole group of people who descended on my garden and in four hours had done all of the spring cleanup, weeding, and mulching. At the same time, others had prepared a delicious repast for everyone. I had not sent the May Day sign, but my friend had. It's hard to impose on others when I think I should be able to do it myself. It's been a strength of mine, or so I thought. This topic couldn't have come at any better time. Three weeks ago, I broke my foot. Not only that, I moved this week. 
Yes, I had professionals move most of the stuff. But after much agonizing, I called on two of my strong female cohorts who are not much younger than me to help move items to storage and artwork to my new abode. But it didn't stop there. The day after the move, one of these women came banging on my door with lunch in hand and insisted on helping me. Four hours later, we had gotten almost everything left in the old place out. And after carrying it all in, side, she finally went home. When I thanked her profusely, she commented, I know if I called ahead, you wouldn't have asked me for help. So I just showed up. Yep, she was right about that. I have no trouble going to the Xfinity store and begging for help or ordering a wheelchair so I can get through the airport this week. But it took a while to ask my other friend to drive me at 5.30 a.m. to the airport. And finally, my worship associate cohort for this morning did the majority of our planning for this service. I didn't ask, but he figured it out. The term Mayday, Mayday has always sounded desperate. And I guess I and many others never want to sound desperate. So I thank those who figured it out and hope that I can do the same for others. When Diane and I were in our 20s, we lived in San Diego. In those days, we spent a lot of time on the beach. On one of those countless sunny beach days, we were out in the waves body surfing with friends when suddenly I could not touch the bottom and I found myself moving away from the shore fast. Within a second or two, I was swept past my friends and was headed out to sea. Diane, standing in the trough of a wave, turned to look for me. As our eyes met, we both realized what was happening. I was in a rip current, pulling me out to deep water. Now, Previous to this, Diane had been a state-ranked competitive swimmer and a certified lifeguard. But that strength and training was useless against the brute force of the ocean. I distinctly remember her facial expression and physical stance in the water, poised between the desire to plunge in after me and the awareness that her best effort would do no good. So what do you do when you hear the Mayday call? You know someone is in peril but you are helpless. Well, I am a fixer. By nature and by profession, I fix things. When I encounter a problem I can't solve, I am filled with feelings of frustration, guilt, inadequacy. It drains me of myself. For me, helplessness is exhausting. Most times, like when the household Wi-Fi goes all mysterious on me, I can shrug it off. But there have been times in my life where the feelings brought on by helplessness have brought me to deep despair. The night before my father died, my brother and I sat with him all through the night at the precarious tipping point between the discomfort of his body and the frightening places his pain medication took his mind. I could not fix things for the man who had taught me everything I know about fixing things. Or the afternoon my daughter was being prepped for the third of three surgical procedures in one week to rearrange the aberrant arteries in her chest. As I stood just outside the orbit of professionals doing their thing, in the eyes of that strong, smart young woman, I recognized the eyes of a beautiful, helpless infant whose every problem I could fix but that day I was useless. Or the phone conversations with my brother in the years before the demons that plagued his body and spirit overwhelmed him. In those conversations, I could not rewind the clock and protect him from the traumas of decades earlier 
that had put him on that rocky road. In all these cases, someone dear to me was being pulled out to sea, and I was in the shallows, helpless. So what do you do when you hear the mayday call, you know someone is in peril, but you are helpless? This is the kind of question that defies the analytical methods I've been trained in. It can't be answered with knowledge and logic and the easy language of math. With this kind of question, I have found the language of metaphor is much more helpful. Metaphor is not a method of analysis. It doesn't take things apart. Metaphor synthesizes the answer in its entirety. The Reverend Scott Alexander, minister at the UU Fellowship of Vero Beach, Florida, uses a metaphor he refers to as waiting in the garden to describe what to do when you are helpless. The metaphor is the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was taken to be killed. If you are not familiar with the story, it is the point where Jesus wrestles with the realization that his fate is sealed. He is headed for a brutal death. It is in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus sends out his mayday call. Reverend Alexander focuses on an interesting aspect of the story. Jesus asks his friends to wait with him, to stay awake while he prays. Jesus does not expect his friends to save him. He knows they can't. He simply asks them to stay awake, to wait with him, to see things through. This metaphor is the answer I cling to when I feel helpless. Sometimes when there is nothing that can be done, being present, staying awake, seeing things through is all that is asked of you. It sounds easy, but I have found it is the hardest thing to do for a loved one. The feeling of helplessness makes me want to say or do something, anything, even if it makes things worse. Things will be okay, we'll fix this. It fills me with doubt and guilt. I must be missing something. Why can't I fix this? Helplessness pushes me to withdraw or flee. If I can't fix this, I'm not sure I can bear it. But being present and awake is the only thing to do when there is nothing else to do. On that sunny day on the beach so long ago, I don't remember exactly how, but I was able to swim to safer waters and my toes finally found a firm purchase on the sandy bottom. In my struggle, I knew Diane couldn't save me, but I knew she was there and she had an eye on me. I can't say if that was the first time, but I know it was not the last time she waited with me in the garden. May we all muster the strength we need to be present and awake when we are called to wait in the garden. May it be so, and blessed be it, may it be. Now, let us join Kay in singing our final hymn, Lean on Me, number 1021. to bear the 
that you can't carry. I'm right up the road. I'll share your load. If you just call me, lean on me. When you're not strong, then I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. Or it won't be long. Somebody to lean on. Just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. I just might have a problem that you don't understand. We all need somebody to lean on. As we depart from one another, let our hearts be secure through every human season. Let our hearts be secure in seasons of anguish as in seasons of joy, in seasons of failure as in seasons of success, in seasons of uncertainty as in seasons of security. Let our hearts be secure in this dual reality. We are worthy recipients of love and support. We can never earn, and we are worthy providers of love and support others cannot earn. Let our hearts be secure, for hearts know and understand and will respond if invited in. And now we're turning it over to Jane O'Neill of the LDC for a brief presentation about voting. Good morning, everyone. I have a quick little five minute slide deck to uh, help us go through uh, just some information on how the voting will work for the annual meeting this year. The annual meeting is on May 16th. Oops, I need to click this button here, okay. Um, voting will be done online again, just like last year. We use the same uh, election buddy program. You'll get an email on Wednesday, at May 5 at 5 p.m. So that's 5, 5 at 5, I think. Uh, it will come in your email. It will look like it comes from BUC. Um, check your spam folder if you don't get it. It will have a link in it that is unique to you. So if there is um, a, a situation where two people use the same email address, only one person can use that link. If you um, have more people that want to vote, you'll need to reach out to uh, Kathy Duhame uh, to get an uh, absentee ballot. To be eligible to vote, you must be a member of BUC in good standing for at least the past three months. So that would be February 15th. You just a, a little piece to remember, you must hit submit when you submit your vote. You people uh, on these things sometimes fill things out and then they don't hit submit. If you hit submit, it will trigger an email confirmation that'll come to the same email. If you don't see that, then your vote didn't go through. So use the link and try voting again. If you need some help, contact Kathy or me and we can assist you. The deadline to vote will be exactly at noon on Sunday, May 16th, which of course is the date of the annual meeting. Please don't miss the deadline. There will be nothing we can do once that noon deadline passes. We will result, report the results of the voting at the end of the meeting on May 16th. On this year's ballot, we have uh, four current members and a new member on the board to approve and also two new stewardship chairs for next year. And then uh, we have candidates for the LDC that you'll vote for. Um, an email went out this past Wednesday, April 28th at around four o'clock from Sarah with a list of all the candidates as of that day. Um, there's also a question on COVID-19 stat vaccination status that the, um, it's not really voting, it's reporting on your own status and this completely confidential, the COVID reopening team was hoping to get a sense 
uh, that will help them with their planning for reopening. Every vote is absolutely confidential, including the vote on vaccination. Once your vote is submitted, it's decoupled from your name. So we can't tell who voted in what way. We do have a standing list of people who have in the past um, requested they don't want to do things online or by email. Um, this is not a new list, this is a standing list. And those people we've already arranged to deliver a paper ballot to them. Uh, so if you're on that list, you don't need to reach out. Uh, two follow-up reminders will be sent uh, to all the people on the voting by electronics list. If you don't wanna get reminders, the way to stop the reminders is to go ahead and vote because once your name is, once you vote, your name is removed from the reminder list. And that's my uh, initial presentation. If you have questions, uh, I and a couple other members of the LDC will stay in the main room to uh, answer any other questions you might have.